All right, welcome. We're going to be giving people just another minute or two, and then we'll get started. All right, welcome all. We're just giving people another minute or two if you just joined over the last second or so. so welcome, Sean, Scott, Spencer. Good to good to see you, Hannah, Erica, Ken, Alan. Um, welcome, welcome to the meeting. All right, I think we're I think we're approaching quorum. Uh, if people join a little bit late. We'll uh, we'll catch them up. Um, I've got the chat window pulled up. Um, feel free to just throw in kind of questions as they as they come in and or put your hand up or whatever whatever folks do these days and we'll uh, we'll get them all sorted as, as quick as we can but let's uh, let's begin all right so my name is Frank Furman I am the co-founder and chief growth officer of pad split and we'll be going through uh, our discussion day on doubling cash flow and rental profits so let's begin All right, when we start, you know, when you think about housing and, you know, affordable housing is, you know, is in the news today and people think about it, you know, I want you to imagine for a minute someone who is functionally homeless, right? What does that mean? What do, what do such people do? Maybe they commute from further and further away to get to something they can afford. Maybe they crash on someone's couch. Maybe they sleep in their car or at the airport. Um, I'd like for you to meet Mariah. She's a writer at a church here in Atlanta. She earns about $20,000 a year. So she's working um, full time, but obviously on the low income end of the scale. Um, and, you know, for any of the real estate investors on the line, you think, well, sure, a, you know, one bedroom apartment. I mean, good luck finding one for 900 bucks here, but you, know, you typically require three times your rent and income. And you say, okay, well, $20,000 a year. You do the math and you think, well, that that doesn't come out to 900 bucks. It comes out to about 600 bucks. How does Mariah get an apartment? And the answer is she doesn't. She can't. You know, there's no housing stock available for someone, even like her who's working, um, who is, you know, decent credit. Um, it just, you don't meet that minimum bar. So what was Mariah doing? She was sleeping on her friend's couch and she isn't alone, right? She's one of over 14 million long renters. Um singles and couples, just singles in the U.S. who frankly don't have good options, right? People who make less than $35,000 a year generally do not qualify for, for housing. You know, it's a market of over $100 billion annually. So it's a big, big, big part of the market, the biggest part of the round market, in fact. So what we do at Pads with our very core, right? We are a two-sided marketplace. We sit in the middle in between hosts, you know, landlords and, and members, residents in the houses. But really the 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 functional core of what we do is we show property owners how to capture and monetize underutilized space, right? We're creating housing units effectively out of thin air, out of the underutilized space. So again, on the ground, what we do with property owners through our experience and our playbooks and our customer support is to show them how to take a, a very typical rental property. Again, predominantly single family homes. We're also in apartments and you know we're, we're quite agnostic on that point. We like them both. But taking a property like this, that's maybe a four bedroom home, pretty standard rental property and saying, okay, well, how would you repurpose this dining room or an office or a basement or, you know, what have you to create additional bedrooms? Um, the appeal for the, the renters, right, is that it 
is increasing the supply, which drives down prices and they're getting better leverage from shared utilities, shared space. Um, and the advantage, of course, the property owners, they simply make a significantly higher return on their assets. So what does that look like in practice? This is, this is kind of the flow of how we work together. Again, like I said, we're a two-sided marketplace. On one side is, is the host, the landlord, right? So what they do is, you know, they own the property, right? They list on our platform the way that uh, an Airbnb host would list on Airbnb.com, except instead of a short-term rental, these are long-term rentals. And instead of fractional in terms of time, we're fractional in terms of space, right? So they list it and they manage the property. They're doing the hosting, right? They're welcoming people in their home. What we do for hosts is one, we're lead generation, which is a huge part of the market and screening. So for every person coming in, we're doing a background check, credit check, income verification, employment verification, and just filling the rooms, right? In some cases in as little as hours from, uh, from when they're listed. And we do what we call the resident management, not to be confused with the property management. So leaky sink, that's the host responsibility, right? They touch the property. If it's interpersonal dispute, Johnny ate my peanut butter, um, all of the collections side of things, you know, payments, that is handled by pad splits, part of what we do. And then of course, and this is a really important part of it is we've been doing this for 10 years, right? So we understand kind of uh, from beginning to end, from the acquisition phase, the renovation phase, to the operations phase, how you do this because, because we have. So, you know, playbooks that have, uh, you know, we've made every mistake that you can in this business, uh, sometimes more than once. And, uh, and what our hosts do is learn from that. So when we say, you know, hey, you should really think about not having a couch in this property because we know bad things happen on couches. It's because we've had couches and we've had problems and we've, we've learned from it. So whether it's locks or how to renovate a property or how to think about a cul-de-sac versus a corner lot versus uh, street parking versus around the back parking and proximity to public transit, these are things that we have done across all phases and everywhere in the life cycle of these properties. Um, and that's what we bring to bear for our hosts. And of course, on the other side of the market, you have the residents, right? The folks actually living in the house, people like Mariah, right? They come to our site, you know, they see the ads and uh, referrals and so on that we're constantly running. They find and book the rooms at padsplit.com, the way an Airbnb guest goes to Airbnb and, and books a, a room for vacation, except in this case, it's long-term. They can roommate, rate their roommates and, and the units as, as well as the maintenance tickets actually. And they pay one easy all-in bill, all electronically. So none of this money orders or cash in a lockbox, um, no driving it to a landlord or property manager's house or office, one easy bill, no utility bills. It's all baked into that one kind of easy price. And what we do for them is we ensure the quality of the units and experience, right? We are willing and have done in the past, uh, remove properties from our platform if they don't meet uh, our kind of safety and quality requirements. We're screening all their roommates, you know? So when, whenever people say, hey, you know, why do I have to do a background check? The answer is, trust me, you want us to background check everybody, you know, with everyone in the house. So we're doing that and managing those disputes. And of course, we provide an easy use platform for them to pay, rate each other, submit maintenance requests, and so on and so forth. And we're the only co-living company addressing the low-income market. You know, if you look kind of on the bottom right, there's a lot of folks and, you know, God bless them. It's a, it's a business to be in, uh, in this kind of upscale co-living space. So Common and Ali and Bungalow and a few of these folks have actually really struggled during the pandemic as, uh, as high income renters have other options and have kind of moved out of some urban areas um, or back in with mom and dad and that kind of thing. But, you know, a very competitive space and, and ultimately not a huge space. You know, there's a, a limited numbers of high income singles who are pre having a family, but post college and you're really kind of threading the needle in some extent. But OK, that's it's a business to be in. Or there's an enormous market for workforce rentals, which is why you hear about it because it's you know it's a hard challenge. So it's a third of the entire U.S. rental population. It's a big, big, big market, and uh, for better or for worse, no one, no one but us is crazy enough to work there. So, uh, so there you have it. All right. So for those of you who are, you know, conceptual, you know, high level, you want to hear about Mariah, you can go to our website right now. I won't be offended if you tune out. But for those of you who are in love with the numbers and want to hear about the numbers, just stick with me and we're going to go through it. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll tell you about it because the reason that hosts work with us is to increase yield, right? That's uh, their investors. That's how this works. So, you know, let's, let's get down to it. 
So again, if you think about that four bedroom property that we showed earlier, your kind of traditional single family rental, um, here on the left, you know, hey, you get it, you rent it out traditionally, pretty established, lots of property managers can handle it. You know, it's a long standing business, straightforward. You know, maybe you're renting it out for 1700 bucks a month, you know, in kind of a transitioning area, maybe bought for 200K. You know, you feel you're doing pretty well, right? You're paying some maintenance each month, right? You're paying your property manager 10%, pretty standard. So, you know, before taxes and insurance and debt service, you're clearing about 1400 bucks a month and, you know, you think you're doing pretty well. Well, again, this, you know, I'm a, I'm a former Marine, so don't make me do math in public, but, you know, you take that same house, six folks, you know, typically about 140 to 160 bucks a week. That's about 600 bucks a month for rent, 600 times six, that's about $3,600. Again, maybe paying a little bit more maintenance, you know, you're paying a pad split fee. We take a, a flat cut of collected revenue, right? I got kids, they got to eat. So you gotta, gotta pay that. You know, maybe your property manager is making a bit more um, because uh, there's there's multiple rooms and it's a new model. They're happy paying utilities, which, as I said earlier, is bundled into that price. Well, even with that higher expense load, you're clearing significantly more income. In this case, on a you know an 85 percent increase, but on average, it's 129 percent increase of net operating income um, each month. So, you know, again, the landlords don't work with us because. Uh, you know, it's easy or because uh, they, they love working with me, far from it. It's because they're making more money, right? They're, they're looking out for, for their families and their investors. Now, the fact is, you know, some of you are looking and saying, okay, well, I'm doing this work. I'm, uh, I'm investing in the property. I'm furnishing it. You know, is it really plausible to invest that more, you know, that, that extra capital up front? And the answer is, sure, if the yield's a whole lot better, people are doing it every day. Um, so again, that, that kind of traditional rental on the left, okay, you're clearing 1400 bucks monthly NOI, you bought it for 200K. Okay, you've got insurance, you're doing that either way. You've got property taxes, can't avoid that. And you've got term costs, right? You know, people stay for about two years on average in low-income rentals. And every couple of years, it means you got to paint and handle some deferred maintenance and take those things. And okay, you know, you're paying those things and okay, 5% return on cost, unlevered. That's that's pretty good in SFR. That's actually well above market, especially with where asset costs are. And you know, most people are doing this and they feel they're doing pretty well. They'll get long-term debt, drive that up, you know, be feeling pretty good. Well, again, when you increase your top line revenue, in some cases, you know, doubling it in many cases, yeah, you know, you you bought that same house for 200 k and Let's even say uh, quite conservatively, or I should say quite aggressively, you're spending eighteen thousand dollars to furnish the house, which would be, which would be a lot, probably more than what most folks are doing. Well, look, you got to count that. That's in your, you know, that's uh, that's your cost, right? But again, your insurance, you got to pay the way. Tax, you got to pay the way. But you don't have annualized turn costs because you aren't turning the unit, right? One person leaves, you turn the room, it gets rolled into maintenance. You know, we'll we'll talk about we'll do a deep dive on that, but ultimately we're typically seeing an average return on cost in excess of twelve percent, um, which again, once you lever up, you're talking cash on cash returns in the thirties and forties. Um, so again, the reason that people willingly throw in this extra money to furnish the units and get it set up is because the yield is just simply higher, even on that increased cost basis. So let's look at some actual pad split properties. Again, these are all actual pad splits. Um, you know, they're furnished, but simply, right? We don't provide linens. This is really just for the pictures. It's just kind of a beds and so forth, or I should say hosts don't provide the linens, but um, you know, numbers on the doors, right? Pretty, pretty simple, um, very simple kind of furnishings, mounted fire extinguishers, you know, simple, safe, functional. That's 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 our credo. All right, so let's look at a few case studies. So this is a property, 2635 Preston Drive. It's in South DeKalb County, Georgia, so just outside of Atlanta. Um, it's been a pad split for about two years now, right? So it's, uh, you know, came on in 2019. Post bought it for $128,000. It needed a fair amount of work to get up and running. It, you know, wasn't rent ready as it was, but it's big house, split level, 2,100 square feet, had five bedrooms. Well. This is a basement unit. Basement was finished to turn it into 
two additional bedrooms. So it became a seven two. So again, actual costs of seeing the invoice, $42,000 to finish out the basement, get it ready, um, fix you know any deferred maintenance and so on. So it was all in for 170K. It had previously been rented um, privately for 1380 a month, right? So, you know, previous owner was thought they were doing okay. They're they're about making the one percent rule. They thought they're doing all right. Well, it's seven bedrooms. Again, this these are actual, um, including the pandemic, actual revenues, including all the issues that have kind of gone on over the last year. It is averaged over four thousand dollars a month gross revenue. So again, you know, there's a pad split fee, there's utilities, there's maintenance. Uh, he's paying his property manager 8% of gross. So property manager, he used to be making 138 bucks a month is now making more than double that. So property managers loving them, you know, so expenses are higher, but a hundred or 92% higher net operating income, you know, unlevered again, pre and he's since refinanced the property, but, um, uh, unlevered return on cost of 10%, right. And IRR over 20%, again, unlevered. So, Incredible returns. This is a uh, this is a host who's gone on. This I believe was his second house, but he's gone on to do another five after this, and now has essentially passive income that replaced his old income. Moving across town to twenty three ninety six Sandgate Road. Again, this is uh, kind of West Atlanta, really uh, sort of College Park um, ish area or city of South Fulton. You know, sort of a, an unsexy split level house, but it's big. You know, it's uh, 1,700 square feet, but that doesn't include the basement. Um, so host put about 40 grand into it to, again, make it rent ready and then also furnish it. He bought it for $138,000. So it was in for about 180 grand, all in. It had previously been a Section 8 rental for about 1450 a month. Um, so again, the, the previous owner was doing pretty well, like really quite well, given their investment. Well, this one's doing a lot better. Because again, after getting it set up and, and fixed up, eight bedrooms, it's been generating, and these are all actuals, 4,400 bucks a month. So even net of the fees and utilities and all those costs and the property managers making more money than they were before, it's still 80% higher net operating income. It's a 12% unlevered return on cost. Again, that probably you're talking about a cash on cash close to 40% and an IRR of over 20 unlevered. I mean, that's, uh, that's tough to beat. So, you know, folks look at this and they say, I get it. People have done it. I can see how I can do it, understand, but, you know, real investors know, real real estate investors know that vacancy and term costs are what kill you, right? You, you think you're doing all right. You're making money, you're making money, you're making money, and then you get slapped with the big bills. So, you know, all those folks, what does that mean? Well, tell you what, that was kind of why we got in this business. You know, if you think about a traditional rental and each of these blue dots is an occupied month and a red one is a, is a vacant month, you know, you get a tenant in there and average tenure for low income rentals about two years. So, you know, you're doing fine, you're doing fine. You're making your 1400 bucks a month. Everything's good. You're probably not getting much in the way of maintenance. You know, they're kind of tending themselves. And then, you know what, after two years they leave and you spend a month renovating the property, average cost for a rental term is about $4,000, right? Because you have to paint everything, you're handling deferred maintenance, you know, fixing all the stuff that you, you hadn't kind of dealt with, um, you know, pick, you know, patching walls, doing all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, you then spend a month leasing it up. So again, even though it was occupied this whole time, well, it's not for two months as you fix it up and then lease it up. And so you still have some vacancy and you have some term costs. Okay, fine. Um, again, that same pad split, six bedrooms. Well, the average tenure is about eight and a half months. So, you know, even though it's not quite disorderly in real life, and we actually typically refill rooms in less than two weeks, but, you know, a member leaves, you turn the room, but it's just the room. And the average cost is about 75 bucks. So typically just sweeping it out, replacing a mattress cover, a little Febreze, maintenance guy usually does it in about 20 minutes. So it's really trip charge. So you're going through, hey, someone leaves, you turn the room, you fill it up and it's back to normal and so on and so forth. So again, over that time, you've got small turn costs over time, you know, room turn, room turn, you know, every, every month, every other month or so, okay, room turns happening, maintenance guys to go out, get eyes on the property, all well and good. But all these little room turns where you're not touching the kitchen, you're not touching common areas, you're not uh, 
leaving it vacant for a whole time. Sure, you end up with some some net vacancy. We're actually today about ninety six percent occupancy across our portfolio. So, you know, we're we we take a lot of pride in that. Where what we think we're really good at is filling these rooms as quickly as possible. Um, in Atlanta, we're really up around ninety nine percent occupancy. Um, you know, in our most established market, but those turn costs end up being a lot lower and really just end up getting rolled into your property management costs and your, and your r &M. So you're never getting stuck with that big bill. You never have to borrow. You never have to worry about cash flow because, you know, you have little things as, as they go. So a lot of people say, okay, great. I got a vacancy and turn costs are lower. That sounds fantastic. But, you know, what about maintenance day to day? A lot of people in the house, how's that going to impact things? And let's take a look. So, you know, won't those repairs and maintenance costs be higher? And, and the answer is, it depends, right? So, you know, let's let's go through it. Again, that traditional rental, look, lawn care is lawn care. It doesn't matter what's going on with it. The costs are the same. There's no difference between a pad split and a traditional rental. The yard is the yard. Okay, fine. Your major appliances, so HVAC, fridge, you know, dishwasher, the costs tend to be the same, you know, major appliances fail when they fail. If anything, it's probably a little bit better in a pad split for two reasons. One is that in a pad split, because we recommend controlling the thermostat, you know, the smart thermostat uh, with, the, with the pin code, effectively some of the failures that you have in HVAC go away because why does HVAC fail? Well, it typically fails because people put outside of their operating envelope, right? They crank it down to a really low temperature in the summer and you freeze your heat pump or they turn it on really high in the winter and it gets overworked and you get short. Um, or frankly, you know, in our model, we recommend not having dishwashers um, because dishwashers are prone to maintenance issues and leaks and, and frankly don't get a ton of use in co-living because no one's doing a, a whole load of dishes the way that I, I do every single day for me and my kids. Um, so actually appliance, major appliance costs tend to be probably a little bit higher in a traditional rental, but let's call it, let's call it the same. Routine maintenance, look, you're gonna have more than pad split, right? You have six people in the house. In a traditional rental, you know, some people might fix it up, you know, okay, fine. They don't want to call the landlord. Look, six people, no one's taking on you're you're gonna get more routine tickets. It's gonna happen. You know, if the sink leaks, someone's gonna have a problem with it. Even if five people don't mind, you're gonna hear about it. Um, if something breaks, you're going to hear about it. You know, that's fine. But deferred maintenance, again, you know, what's what's a landlord's kind of worst nightmare in a lot of cases? It's, hey, there's a problem and I don't even know about it, right? People let this leak just go on and on and on. Well, again, the, the annoying thing about co-living is you always hear about it. The good thing is you always hear about it. So that slow leak, again, even if, even if five people will pass by and never think anything of it, um, you hear about it in a pad split, because you have six spies in that house. So someone undoubtedly is going to say, you know, we, we got to submit a maintenance request. Um, and so you hear about it. So the good news is you have less deferred maintenance that you're handling all at once. And then the last one's dispute is a little bit counterintuitive. So I want to, you know, hit on it a touch and that, you know, people look at and they say, gosh, six strangers in a house. I bet you have a lot of fights. And the answer is, look, it, it's happened before. I'd love to tell you uh, all pad split members are best friends, but it's actually less than traditional rentals. You know, if you think about traditional rentals and disputes happen all the time, fights happen, they happen between husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, you know, brothers will rough house and one will throw one through the wall and hang up a poster over it. So again, the, the kind of damage, the r and that happens from disputes happens with families, right? They happen between people who know each other and love each other and thus are incited to rage when they don't get their way and so on. Uh, pad splits are strangers. So again, usually, you know, people aren't necessarily best friends. Um, you know, they may leave each other bad ratings on our website and that's fine, but typically strangers don't fight. They, they just don't. So actually in the, in the grand scheme of dispute related maintenance. We may, our call center works overtime handling, you know, Johnny ate my peanut butter and I don't like this person and this person microwaved fish in the microwave and that smells bad and I don't like it and all that stuff. Okay, that's what we're there for. We handle that, we have a team. Thankfully it isn't me because I'd be terrible at it, but a whole team who's dedicated to handling those things. Um, 
but the hey you know me and my wife uh fought well we don't have husbands and wives so we don't have that that happens in traditional novels so actually that ends up being being a little bit better again we underwrite the properties to assume a little bit higher maintenance in a pad split because we're kind of over indexing on this but um realistically in many cases it ends up being about the same all right, our property owners, our hosts, they're core of our business, right? 82% um, plus uh, increase in owner earnings over traditional rentals. Again, the average ends up being up over 100%. Kind of some of the most important things for us is, you know, 76% add additional units after the first property. Again, it's not because being a pad split host is easy or real estate investors easy, it isn't, but it's because they're making more money and they want to do even more of that. And of course, owner churn, um, We've been blessed, I think, with a really loyal cohort of, of hosts, of, of property owners who, again, they, they aren't sticking with us uh, with the program because it's easy, but because they're, they're doing well. And that's, that's kind of what they're solving for. And I mean, another kind of uh, point, uh, this is, uh, his name's not on here, but I don't really care about sharing it. His, his name's Josh Stanton, he's a friend of ours, one of our early hosts, a pioneer. Um, He's also Keller Williams real estate uh, agent. So again, like a lot of Pat Split hosts, they work in real estate adjacent uh, real estate industries. And not only has he built this portfolio of Pat Split properties that gives him substantial passive income, we've also referred plenty of business to him and he's really built a business around buying for other hosts as well. So he's brokered about probably about 25 transactions just because of his experience with pad split. And same goes for general contractors and insurers and all sorts of folks. I mean, there are folks who have built their careers really around servicing this host community. And we have a very active preferred vendor program to help support folks like that, who of course help us in, in our mission and referral programs as well. So, uh, you know, hosts who refer other hosts who activate properties, we we also pay. And Josh has been the recipient of those as well. So, you know, he's getting us coming and going. So I'm gonna take a quick pause, um, open up to any questions. Feel free to just throw them in there. I don't, I don't see any in there now, but would love to uh, love to take any questions that everyone has. Um, and then of course, uh, for those of you who don't even have time to ask questions and are just in a mad rush to get started, you can head straight to passable.com slash hosts, get all signed up, you know, create an account. And then uh, our, you know, sales and implementation team is there to help walk you through the whole process. And uh, I, as an aside, you know, in part because of our experience, more because we really care about the product and the experience and the, the, you know, the eventual kind of outcomes for our members, we like to get involved really early. So Again, it's it's not rocket science. I'd love to tell you we're the only people in the world who can do it, but um, we like to get involved even kind of pre-acquisition. So a lot of things we've learned over the years um, that help out with that. Again, we're not we're not brokers. We refer out that kind of work, but you know, not a day goes by that we don't get a what do you think about one, two, three Main Street kind of question. And, that, and that's really what our team is kind of designed to sort of think through. So all right, I see some questions coming in. So I will jump in on these and take them one by one. Okay, from Titus, uh, how do I, or how do we control utility costs? Great question. Um, the answer is controlling utility costs is actually pretty hard. What you, what you can do and what we recommend is kind of a mix of things, but predominantly making uh, investments in the property that drive down the usage independent of of the actual behavior of the members. So what, what does that mean? Um, low flow fixtures, controlling the thermostat. So what we recommend is, you know, HVAC is gonna be at least 50% of your energy costs, right? So the best way to minimize utility costs is to control the thermostat, and which there's lots of systems on the market today that can do that. You lock it with a pin code and you set it to the Georgia Power recommended settings. So it's, you know, warm in the summer and, uh, cool in the winter. And that's how you kind of drive down your costs the way you would in your own home. So that's big. Um, and then some of it's just kind of yeah, low flow fixtures. You know, I, I'd love to tell you there's a way to make people take shorter showers. I'll tell you in my own home, uh, that rule is abused by, uh, by certain members of my family. Um, what is easier is to go on Amazon and buy a Niagara 1.25 gallon per minute 
um, shower head. They cost eight twenty five, and you do that, and it'll cut your water. You know, it's the best investment you'll ever have. 0.5 gallon per minute uh, aerators and faucets, that sort of thing. Low flow toilets sort of makes sense. So it's, um, so that's part of it. Part of it is also, um, you know, air sealing, uh, covering up fireplaces. So there's there's a few things you can do with kind of the envelope of the building. But um, again, this is what our team is trained to do. We're not we're not a construction company. We're not going to you know air seal your property, but. Uh, happy to kind of talk through those sort of processes with you. Um, so again, it's it's much more about making investments so that uh, your costs are controlled as best they can be, given that it's difficult to control the actual usage. That being said, we also have some more reactive uh, measures in place. So, you know, we have, you know, you can communicate with the members and we do some of that as well. Some of it's, you know, kind of reminding folks to keep doors closed and that sort of thing. And, and we can kind of help out with that as well. Um, from Alan, is the 12% fee based on the number of occupied units? It's actually uh, based off actual collected revenue. So if um, it's not a matter of you're saying, hey, I've got six bedrooms and uh, four fill, or, you know, or, oh, here's the prices. And like we calculate that way. It's a matter of $100 comes in, $12 comes to us, 88 goes to you. Is kind of the, the way to think about it. So it's, it's on collected revenue to include late fees and all that, all that sort of stuff. From Marcos about what about parking? Um, that is a great question. And the answer is it really depends on the property. So um, again, there's, there's no silver bullet with a lot of these things. Um, there's no, you know, how much parking is sufficient, how much is good. Uh, you know, the answer is parking is important. Um, what is true is 100% true is that the biggest challenge that these properties have from a management perspective is that a lot of neighbors don't like rentals. And if you have a bunch of people in a house and a bunch of them have cars, you know, our, our members, most are fine folks, but some of them, you know, they're, they're cut from the, the crooked timber that is humanity. And uh, some of them don't park like ladies and gentlemen, you know, they may park in front of uh, someone's mailbox or a, uh, you know, in front of someone's driveway or on the grass and all that kind of all that kind of stuff. So, again, like I said before, we like to get involved really early in the process with hosts so that they can make good decisions even before they purchase the property, right? So, some things to think about on that front. And we have other webinars that we go through where we we really talk about picking the right asset. But kind of the the high level piece on that is, um, you know, when you think about properties and where to buy and what makes a good pad split. Closer to public transit is better because the closer you are to public transit, fewer cars, fewer neighbor complaints, all good. Um, having ample street parking is important. So again, I that's why I really prefer, say, a corner lot to a cul-de-sac because a cul-de-sac, you have less street parking than you otherwise would and a, and a corner lot, you have more. Um, obviously, your driveway matters. Um, you know, it, some have more spots than others. Some are easier to... to add in additional parking, let's say a gravel patch or something like that. Um, some houses, you know, I see a house that has parking around the back and, you know, it sets my heart aflutter, you know, so it's because uh, I'm sort of a weirdo that way, but it's, uh, the answer is it depends. And it also depends on the number of bedrooms. I mean, we have houses with 12 bedrooms. Um, they, I certainly wouldn't do, you know, a, a 10 bedroom house that has two parking spots. You know, I think you're asking for trouble but one that's right on public transit with parking and so on, you know, is totally consistent with kind of the neighborhood expectations and kind of good judgment. So I realized that was sort of a weasel answer. There's no, hey, it must have X number of spots or here's the math equation to get there. Um, it's more a matter of discretion, judgment, you know, how do you uh, look at each asset in a vacuum and say, what does this look like given the neighborhood and the expectations of the property and public transit and all those, all those things. Um, from Dolores, do we have a contract? And if so, how long is it? So the answer is um, yes, but it's, it's effectively, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of like, not, it's not a long-term commitment or anything from the host perspective. The only thing we ask for in our agreements is that if you activate a property and you get it filled up and you have active uh, members in the house, um, 
you give us 30 days to move folks if you decide to move on. Now, the reason for that is not because, um, you know, we're, we're trying to trap you in anything for 30 days. It's so that if, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, an example. We had one of our early hosts was, a, was an accidental landlord, a gentleman who, uh, you know, bought a new house because he was starting a family and his old house, uh, person who put it under contract, you know, fell through. So anyway, he decided to list it as a pad split and had it with us for about a year and he was doing well. And he called me about a year later and said, his name was Joshua. And he said, hey, you know, I feel terrible, but this neighborhood, which was in South Atlanta, is really hot. And some investor came down, offered me $400,000 for the property. And I just feel awful because we have this agreement and the people are living there. And I'm like, Joshua, sell the property. Like, what is wrong with you, man? Like, you sell it today. Like, hang up the phone. You know, and look, did I want 30 days to move people with, with a little dignity? Yeah, of course. You know, we you know, want to be uh, respectful of that. But you know, I'm an investor. You want to use, you want to go to the highest and best use. So um, the answer is, look, we, we made it work. So again, we, we asked for that 30 days so that we can do it gracefully, um, but there's no long-term commitment for hosts. So yeah, no, no worries there. Um, all right. Also from Alan, what happens with property damage, minor and significant? Great question. Uh, the answer is it kind of depends. So the, the super high level view is um, for every, we don't do deposits for lots of reasons, uh, some of them legal, but for every house we charge, uh, it's a default that you can set it to a default of a hundred bucks. You can set it to wherever you want, but a move-in fee of a hundred dollars, right? And everyone pays it and it goes to the landlord essentially immediately. So, you know, someone moves in, they're paying you a hundred bucks. It kind of replaces a deposit, right? And the idea is what we found is Look, it, it's supposed to cover the cost of that eventual room turn. Now, some people break things on their way out, um, you know, or not that they're not even maliciously, but like, look, you know, someone lives in a room for a year, two years, you know, sometimes things degrade over time. That money, which again is non-refundable, really goes towards that. Now, when people... Um, damage things. And again, it, oftentimes in a co-living situation, it's, you don't always know what happened, right? Because it's not like, you know, hey, here's Alan's family living in this property. It doesn't matter if it was him or his kids or his, you know, his buddy, Alan's name's on the lease, he's, uh, he's on the hook. So that's, that's a little bit clouded in co-living. That's, that's the reality of it. Um, we do maintain the ability to charge, you know, if they're living there and they're there and, and so on. You can pass those costs on through. Um, for significant damage, you know, major damage, it really becomes an insurance question. Um, you know, again, that what, what you mean by significant is is sort of um, it is a is a good one. But you know, if someone uh, I don't know, God forbid, burns down your house, you know, that's what homeowners insurance is is for. I don't think you're going to be able to pass through, you know, two hundred thousand dollars, you know, to uh, to one of the folks in the house, I, I don't even think, well, it just wouldn't work. So, um, so yeah, so it, it depends a little bit on how major or minor it is. There are some mechanisms to pass it through. We do have a resolution center to kind of handle those. But for the most part, the idea is to take that move-in fee and have it kind of balance out for all the sort of minor stuff, the wear and tear. Because again, you're getting paid that and you're not, uh, you're not holding deposits. Um, from Spencer, given the high house prices and lumber costs, what has been the impact to host returns? You know, it's a great question. Um, it certainly hasn't been helpful. Um, you know, I would love for house prices for lots of reasons to uh, maybe return to normal and, and certainly lumber costs, which is of uh, really kind of no use to anybody um, except the mill, I suppose. But um, so host returns look, I mean, it's a little bit uh, by design. I mean, it means, and this is true, not just for pads, but for everywhere. I mean, rates go up accordingly, you know, like what people, sometimes people are like, oh, like, gosh, it's going to be, it, I guess returns are compressed and it's like, well, or prices are going to go up, you know, this is, this is inflation. This is kind of the impact. So um, prices go up accordingly to sort of cover some of that. Um, 
you know, you're probably having some return compression on that. Uh, the other thing is hosts are probably going a little bit bigger and a little bit of a wider aperture than they were before. So, you know, in the, in the, the olden days, you know, the, uh, the tech stars days for, for pad split, um, you know, almost every house we had was, was inside the perimeter. In fact, it really was, um, you know, Southwest Atlanta was South the cab, those sorts of areas. Now, just again, just in the Atlanta context, you know, we're everywhere from Douglasville to Noonan to Ackworth to, you know, Gwinnett County, Jackson County. I'm more than 15 counties now in Georgia. Um, so to some extent, investors have been changing what they buy to, to account for it. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of um, all those things kind of going on because obviously the investors aren't just uh, taking it lying down. Um, are there limits on the size and number of rooms you can have in a house? The answer is yes. Um, there are limits that are both legal. Um, there are limits that are kind of uh, construction e and you know just limitations of the actual asset. And then there's of course uh, limits that are more a question of discretion. So we'll kind of go um, go through them kind of one by one. So. As far as the number of bedrooms, uh, for the most part, you're more trying to fit in with the given, as, as far as the legal side, fit in with the neighborhood and kind of neighborhood's expectations. So again, we're in multifamily areas. We have, we have places with 10 bedrooms. You know, that's, that's possible. Some of them are duplexes, some are multifamily, you know, so the, the actual, all regulatory is kind of hyper-local, um, which, which complicates things. But we, I wouldn't go really above 10. And in general, anything above eight, I think uh, you begin to have a little bit of a tragedy of the commons on uh, especially kitchen usage. Now we require that no more than four bedrooms can share a bathroom. So if you have a nine bedroom house, which many folks do, you need at least three bathrooms. Um, and also kind of along those lines, like they need to actually be accessible. So you can't have say a six bedroom house with one master bath and then one common, cause then you really have five bedroom sharing one bathroom. So this may be more bathroom talk than everyone was uh, anticipating, but, but here we are. Um, so yeah, there's, and I mean, again, it comes down to parking. I mean, we have investors who come to us and say, hey, you know, I'd really like to do this. I think I could fit in 10 bedrooms and you say, really with that level of parking, with that level of, uh, you know, that far from public transit, so on and so forth, like you're, the neighbors are going to be up in arms because people are going to be parking everywhere and on their, you know, it's going to be insane. Um, you, you might be able to do it. It may be legal, but it might be just a terrible idea. So there's, that's, again, that's one of the things that our team is there to work with folks on and kind of, um, not give that discretion, but at least kind of talk through some of it. And it, and it really comes down to a, a property by property sort of analysis in a lot of cases. Um, from Titus, how does the price per room get set? So the answer is that the host sets it whatever they want. Um, now we, we do have a pricing tool that recommends a price, same as, you know, kind of Airbnb would. So, you know, you, you get in there and it might say, hey, ba it, it basically looks at other rates in the area and the properties of the property, I guess, of the room. So, you know, private baths, it's higher, that kind of thing. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's host prerogative. Now, if if you price it, and, and not that people are crazy, but sometimes, you know, people are like, oh, I want to get, you know, 700 bucks a month, and they price it at 700 bucks a week. I mean, we have a team that will reach out and say, are you sure? Because that seems not right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's host prerogative because, you know, you got to set your own pricing to get, you know, manage your own returns and so on. Um, now, we may think it's a bad idea. And, and oftentimes we're asked for our advice during that setup phase, but it's, but it's your, your house, you know, your decision. Um, from Marcos, how many baths per bedroom is ideal? Well, one is, is ideal. Um, you know, private baths are highly desired, uh, typically carry about a 30% price premium. Um, or more. So, you know, in a perfect world, every, every bedroom would have its own bathroom. Um, in the real world where we live in, that's uh, relatively rare. So, you know, in general, it's, it's that more is more in that, you know, 
there's a big price premium for a private bath. There's a smaller price premium for Jack and Jill, but it's still desirable. And in general, if you have a house, you know, we have houses that are eight twos. They, they work fine, right? Um, but certainly if one goes down, maintenance, that kind of thing, then you only have one, things can get dicey. I mean, more is better. It gives you some redundancy, makes people happier. But, um, but in general, it's, yeah, I mean, ideal is just more is more. So from Spencer, what is the most common issue hosts have to deal with? Um, that is a good question. I mean, I would say the most common issue is just kind of, uh, I mean, and I guess it depends on what, what you consider an issue. Um, you know, kind of uh, typically small maintenance uh, sort of issues, you know, hey, this trim came loose. Hey, this, uh, you know, this bed uh, broke or, or what have you, kind of small. And in terms of maybe, maybe I'll interpret it the way I want, which is what are the most uh, common frustrating issues hosts have to deal with? I would say that tends to, like things with furnishings and that tends to be among the more frustrating things. Um, clogged toilets. Um, so again, it's uh, some hosts actually even provide toilet paper because they look at it and say, you know what, this may help me avoid, um, you know, frustrating, uh, extremely frustrating clogged toilets every now and again. So I'd say in terms of where we hear complaints um, that are, you know, make people mad, clogged toilets is, is a big one. And some of that honestly isn't behavior driven. I mean, uh, in the geographies we're in and Atlanta being obviously a major one, you know, roots and pipes can cause that. A lot of these kind of older houses that have had deferred maintenance, um, so it isn't always just that people are shoving things down the toilet, but it, uh, yeah, clogged toilets is the thing that makes makes people mad. Um, yeah, let's see what other things. I mean, general messiness um, is again, it's it's not a host responsibility, as in it's a uh, it's on the members. Members have to clean the house. You know, no one hears your mom. That's that's the deal. But um, in terms of things that make hosts a little bit angry. Um, hey, you know, blah, 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 uh, was there to fix the leaky sink, but this place, you know, it was messy. And, and we have some ways that we address that and uh, house leaders and all, all sorts of things. But it's, uh, but that's, you know, people don't like that. People don't like mess. Um, do insurance from Brian, do insurance companies refuse to insure co-living properties? The answer is there are some that probably would not. Um, there's plenty that do, and we can refer you to those that do. Um, for the most part, what feedback we've gotten from insurance companies, because again, we've, you know, I own co-living properties, they're, ins they're insured. Um, most of the big shops will do it. Um, most hosts don't even come to us because they, you know, they own other properties and they just use the same folks they do. Most of the risks, I mean, if you think about uh, what, um, what risks are actually covered by homeowners insurance, very little of it has to do with kind of the people. Most of it's like, hey, you know, hurricane hits your house, like in terms of what, what actually adds to their cost. You know, it's, uh, it's weather, it's major systems, it's kind of things that have nothing to do with, with people. Um, so, you know, for the most part, you know, I've talked to probably a dozen insurance companies and brokers and so on. And, you know, the, some may charge a premium, some may not uh, be super excited. And, and there are some that will probably say, hey, this, I, I don't know about the underwriting, this is kind of an unknown. Like, I'm, I'm not saying 100% will prove it, but there's plenty that look at it and say, you know, what are the chances of a hurricane hitting this house or flooding? Exactly the same, no matter what's going on. So, you know, underwriting is not that hard. Uh, from Andrew, is it beneficial to have a house under an LLC or homeowner's name for liability protection? Um, I think personally, um, taking off my pad split hat, but just as my investor hat, landlord hat, I think it's good hygiene to do that for all rental properties. Um, and in part to just sort of, uh, you know, protect you if, uh, you know, if you own a traditional rental here, you don't want it impacting you, you know, all, all those sorts of things. Um, so I think it's good hygiene. People do both. Um, you know, we don't require it. We, in, in our world, I mean, just like Airbnb, we don't really care who owns the house or what entity it is or anything else. We need, uh, 
you know, a tax ID to file uh, the, the 1099s that you get at the end of the year, but it's not, um, we're agnostic. I mean, we have all sorts of houses where we don't even know who owns it because it's managed by a property manager, property manager lists it, you know, whatever. But um, I, I think it's good hygiene. I would, I guess, uh, I probably need to issue a disclaimer that I'm not an attorney and I'm not a tax professional. Um, and you should probably consult either or both for, uh, for that kind of advice. But, um, but I, that is something that I do personally for, for what it's worth. Um, so from Dolores, what happens if someone won't move out? Um, that is a great question. Actually, maybe you go back to Spencer's question. This, while rare, is probably the most frustrating thing when it does happen. Um, and so the answer is there's a few things. So one is um, we, you know, what our team is doing, you know, when someone's terminated, which again, the most common reason for someone to be terminated is, is money, right? You know, people fall behind and they don't pay. Um, we have effectively what you would call kind of a easy way, hard way conversation with, with those folks. And we say, look, you know, again, like we, we've tried different things over the years. We've done all sorts of different things, but what we've sort of settled on as most effective is going to someone saying, Hey, look, you know, Jim, you know, here's the situation. You didn't, you know, we all wanted this to work out. didn't work out, right. You fell behind. You got a little extra time. Didn't quite get there. Okay. Look, you know, no big deal, no judgment. Um, and you're an adult. So here's, here's your choices. You know, door one, we shake hands, no judgment. You, you know, maybe I give you an extra day if it's helpful. Hell, I'll help you pack, you know, not a problem. Pad Split has lots of resources in terms of helping you find a job or a shelter, all those sorts of different things. Um, and you know what? The debt that you have is essentially going to be written off. You know, if you want to come back, you'd have to pay that first, but no one's going to chase you. No one's going to, you know, uh, send a collections agent after you, you know part as friends, um, wish you the best of luck. Or there's door two, no judgment, but I'm gonna file for eviction. Um, in the states where we operate, landlord's gonna win and win pretty quickly. And, you know, that's, that's kind of that. Um, and you know what? It's, again, it'll take a little bit longer. You'll probably be here for four to six weeks, um, but it's gonna happen and a marshal will put you out. And then every time you apply for an apartment, this dispossessory is going to be on your record. And every time you get a job, there's going to be a withholding that you need to figure out with your employer. And they're going to wonder why you owe money in collections, but it's going to be paid. And you're going to pay for all the time that you're there. And, uh, but again, like your choice. And most people are pretty damn pragmatic, right? So, um, you know, it's a, uh, it is very rare that we go through a formal eviction process. Now, that were there more during, you know, kind of COVID, in particular when the CDC moratorium was in place? The answer is yes, because people knew it would take longer, but they're being processed. Um, and so, you know, most people don't want to go down that path. Most people want to kind of do the right thing. So they might ask for another day and so on, but it, it ends up being not that contentious. But the answer is occasionally you have to file for eviction. And that's, that's the reality of being a landlord. So it's, again, it's rare, doesn't mean it isn't painful when it happens, but um, we work pretty hard to avoid it. And, um, and, but, you know, if someone will not leave your, you know, your real options, uh, you know, you can't really go in there with a, with a gun and force them out, you know, you, you go through the courts, that's, that's life. Um, so that's, that's kind of, the way that it works sometimes. Um, so from Titus, you probably plan on putting on the platform. Great news. You'll need to re refinance it in a few months. Super. Um, do hosts have issues with traditional lenders? Blah, 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 blah. Um, the answer is some lenders, yes, do not like to lend on it. And we could have a long philosophical discussion about how it's ridiculous for lenders to say, I'd prefer to have $1,200 every month on the first than, um, you know, 3,500 bucks and then 3,429 and then 3,517. And like, that seems insane. Like, why isn't a debt service coverage ratio issue? But the fact is underwriters are underwriters. Um, the short answer is plenty of lenders will lend on this type of property. And we can recommend lenders that 
understand the model and we'll do it. Um, so yeah, again, different folks have done it through different people, but you know, we we're real estate investors ourselves. If you can't refinance property, this whole thing doesn't work. So yeah, happy to, that's what our team is kind of set up. And we have a strong preferred vendors network for that. So from Carol, what are the costs? How much is it to participate with uh, your company? So we, we're just like Airbnb in that regard. We take a 12%. I mean, they're, they actually have a variable fee that ends up being on average about 13.5%, but you, know, you go down that road. But we take a flat percentage of collected revenue. Um, so we don't get paid till you get paid. Um, and then from Andrew, what are some of the housing initiatives and programs that you work with? Um, so great question. The answer is we're partnered with about 40 nonprofits um, throughout kind of all the markets that we're in, in Georgia, Florida, Texas, uh, Virginia, um, some are national, you know, so on and so forth, but it's uh, Louisiana. But, um, you know, mostly nonprofits, some municipalities, some are both. I mean, right now we're actually uh, moving in over 100 people through Partners for Home, which is a, a city of Atlanta nonprofit, you know, it was created by the city council uh, to help with kind of uh, transitional housing and, and continuum of care. So those are, again, paid by the city, um, This uh, these move-ins, um, which is obviously great. So some of them are doing rent assistance, some are just doing referrals, some are just doing other kind of support services. So it's it's a mix of, of those things. Um, and it depends. So we have, we have a full-time staff, um, I mean, full-time staff of two folks who uh, who deal with those partnerships and work with those entities and chase down those those checks, if you will. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, uh, it. I mean, it's everything from Salvation Army and United Way to, you know, Midtown Assistance Center to uh, Anthem Health, uh, you know, all sorts of various folks, staffing agencies. Um, although, I don't know, Andrew, if that answers your question, um, but that's, it's kind of a, it's a cast of, well, maybe not thousands, but dozens, I suppose. From Carol, can tenants stay in the room uh, a year longer? Oh, uh, so the answer is, uh, it's only long-term tenants, Carol. So uh, we have tons of folks who've been with us for two years, three years. Um, so it's not, that's not new to us or anything else. Um, it's actually really, I mean, we have some, we do have some folks who end up staying for a relatively short term, say like one to three months. Now it's a minority, but, you know, some folks, they move in and then they say, you know, ugh, maybe mom was complaining, but uh, at least she cooked for me and now I'm sharing a bathroom and, you know, maybe co-living is not for me and they move out. Okay. You know, that happens. We also have had some folks who, you know, they, we, we end up with a lot of people who are new to town, you know, they don't know the neighborhoods, whatever, they're trying to figure things out. They move in, they kind of get on their feet, they get a feel for things and they're like, okay, well, hey, three months, fine, but now I'm ready to get my own place. And then they move out. That's fine. No big deal. Um, but for the most part, I mean, people assuming they're paying and happy and all that stuff. And, um, you know, some people are better at, at those things than others, but um, we are, really exclusively long-term tenants, even if some people don't really stay long-term. I mean, there are people who live and work in, in the community. Um, how do you get started? Go straight to padsplit.com slash hosts and create an account. Uh, when you do that, um, a member of our kind of uh, implementation team will reach out kind of immediately and, you know, kind of walk you through the whole process. Um, and they're much better at it than I am. Um, as far as how people pay us, it's all electronically. It's all through their dashboard on our website or, you know, on their phone. So it's, um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, they're doing it all through through that. So debit, credit, ACH. Again, we get those rent assistance payments from partners, but it's all, um, all kind of handled on that dashboard. And do we work with property managers? The answer is yes. I mean, essentially every one of our hosts is a property manager in some form or fashion. Sometimes it's a, you know, corporation that manages for other folks and we don't even know the uh, the owner. Other times um, it's the owner managing for themselves. We also have property managers who we can refer you to. Um, looks like my internet is shady, there we go. Um, 
So we've, uh, so again, if you go and create an account and then, you know, when you're talking to an implementation team and say, hey, I'm interested in property managers, we have folks in essentially every market that we're in that we could refer you to. Any owner occupied resident downfalls? Erica, I'm not sure if I understand. You're saying if a, is, are there problems if the owner actually lives in the property or I'm not sure if I understand your question, Erica. Yes, okay. Um, so we do have a few owner occupied properties. Um, it's pretty rare. Um, part of that is just kind of a, uh, I don't know, just the, the way we built the company and kind of who we've marketed to and that kind of thing. There's nothing, uh, you know, illegal about it. It's, it's totally fine. Um, any downfalls? Uh, the only, I guess the only thing that I think uh, owner-occupied units have struggled with, in some ways, it's easier, right? Because we, uh, you know, you're living in the house, like you're keeping an eye on it. People probably behave a little bit better when the owner's there and that kind of thing. So I, you know, I think that's fine. Um, but where I think people struggle with it is that these are long-term tenants. And unlike Airbnb, where you say, okay, I've got my spare bedroom, you know, I'll rent it out and people come for a little bit and they'll leave, they'll come for a little bit, they'll leave, no big deal. And if I decide I don't want to do it anymore, they're gone. You know, people move in and then they're there. And the expectation is they're going to be there for a while. So again, we've we've had a few, you know, a small number, but it's it's come up. Hosts who do it, and they're fine, and no one's done anything wrong. But they're like, hey, you know, my my mom wants to visit. How do I boot this person? And you're like, well, for what? Because you <laughs> weren't thinking ahead. I don't know. Um, so that's the only thing to consider. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, frankly, we just don't have a really strong value proposition for owner occupied units because. You know, most people, if they're just renting one room in their house, you know, Airbnb is easy. You could do that. You can, you can get kind of the short-term commitment, which is fine. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, a lot of people, they want to rent to someone that they know. You know, it's like easier to rent to, you know, a cousin or, you know, my coworker's friend or, or whatever. Um, and we don't really kind of set up, we're not set up for that sort of customization or sort of social side of it. So most people can kind of find their own single person and it makes collections easier and some of that stuff. So it's just rare for us, but there's nothing, um, I don't think that's it. I mean, you can go and you can list a property you can do it today. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, from Carol, do you have to get a permit from the city? Will Pats will take care of that. Um, the answer is, it depends on what you mean by city. Some municipalities require certain permits for, uh, everything, whether it's just a certificate of occupancy um, for any rental property to, you know, lodging facility or, or anything. There's no permit uh, for what we do really anywhere that we operate, um, other than many municipalities requiring a certificate of occupancy. Um, there are some things that exist, like, for example, in Houston, where we have a number of properties, uh, there's a lodging facility that some folks have chosen to go through. Um, there's some pros and cons to that, which your team can kind of work work through with you. But we don't uh, we don't apply for permits. Those permits generally don't exist. Now, what is uh, also a design choice, and again, I'm not advising anyone one way or the other, but is construction permits for folks who are say finishing out a basement or that kind of thing. Again, depends on the municipality. Um, many investors do not get permits. Um, that is. Uh, investors prerogative. We do not check permits. We are not the permitting agency. We don't replace permits. We do inspections of the property virtually um, to make sure that it has smoke detectors and that sorts of thing. But um, we're not a permitting agency. And it's, we, just like Airbnb, we have no ability to apply for like a construction permit on an owner's behalf or, or anything else. That's not a thing that we, we would do. But there really aren't uh, co-living permits uh, almost anywhere, but no, it's, it's not a thing that we do. Um, all right. Well, I'm seeing a, it's sort of slow to a trickle. Um, I think we might be out of questions and I see we're up on time. Um, we'll tell you what, we'll, uh, we'll hit pause here. If you uh, have questions at all, or, you know, obviously create an account. That's my recommendation. 
the whole team set up. If you just email sales at padsplit.com, it'll come to me and the sales team and everyone else and we'll, we'll respond to it. So, you know, don't feel free to, if a question hits you in 10 minutes after you're off, no big deal, just fire away. But uh, with that, I appreciate everyone's time and uh, an interest and engagement. This is a lot of questions, a lot of great ones. So, uh, so yeah, certainly appreciate that. And uh, I hope everyone has a great day and uh, hope to talk soon. All right, bye now.